Hi, everybody. Welcome to our NJ Decides 2022 Election Exchange podcast. I'm David Cruz. Just a few weeks before the midterms, with the balance of power in Congress at stake, here in New Jersey, all 12 congressional seats are being contested. So we're talking with candidates about the important issues facing us all and maybe talking about themselves a little bit. We're joined today by the Democratic incumbent in the 11th Congressional District. The 11th covers parts of Essex, Morris, and Passaic counties. It's a pleasure to welcome Representative Mikey Sherrill. Mikey Sherrill, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you in person. I know. As we said before. We've done a lot of Zooms yes. over the past couple of years. So you came on the scene as this fighter pilot mom. Um, now you're looking for your third uh, term in Congress. Uh, what's, the, what's the pitch? What's the rationale for uh, Mikey Sherrill getting a third term in Congress? You know, that's a great question. Um, And I would say the rationale is this. When I first started running for Congress, one of the major things uh, we were facing here and continue to face is affordability for families, making sure families can afford their bills, feel comfortable, feel secure about their economic future, uh, secure about their economic future here in northern New Jersey. And so with that came um, a focus on continuing to work to lift the state and local tax deduction cap, working to get the Gateway Tunnel Project funded for our economy and for quality of life here, and drive down medical costs, prescription drug costs for people. And so, you know, as I sit here, there are more things at stake than ever. There are more things I'm working on. But as you look at that, um, one of the early pieces of legislation we passed this year was the bipartisan infrastructure law. And that directed that funding to the Gateway Tunnel. And I actually got we got shovels in the ground for the Portal Bridge piece of that earlier yeah. this year. So that was exciting. Um, we you know, something that I had had talked a lot about was letting uh, Medicare negotiate prescription drug prices to drive those costs down. We see that in the VA. And so I wanted to see that in Medicare. We passed that. And not just that, we capped out-of-pocket costs for seniors at 2000 and we also capped insulin costs for seniors at $35. And I'm still, we passed the state and local tax deduction fix through the House several times now, twice now. Um, and now I'm looking at the tax extenders at the end of the year. So I think that relentless focus on what I need to do to deliver for New Jersey is um, is what has some is something that you know I have I've committed to the district to do. I've continued to do that, and I'd be honored to continue to do that for a third term. We talked about that fighter pilot mom. Um, but I'm going to we... stop you because I'm actually a helicopter pilot, but helicopter I'm sorry. Mo- helicopter no, you're right. mom doesn't doesn't necessarily <laughs> sound as good. But... Yeah, right. A helicopter pilot. You're right. Um, So how are you different? I mean, how are you different and how is this country different four years on, five years on? Well, I think the things that make me different are the things that are more important than ever, given what this country's gone through. And I'll tell you, um, I think my focus on this nation, what we are, but what we could be and what I need us to be, not for me, but for my four kids is what makes me different. So, you know, I'll tell you, my grandfather fought in World War II. He was shot down over occupied France. I grew up during the Cold War seeing the difference between our values and the way people in this country were able to live their lives versus how people behind the Iron Curtain had to live their lives. And that was a really stark difference. Um, And then I wanted to have that same sense of mission for our country. And so that's why I joined the military and served in the Navy for almost 10 years. It's why after I got out and went to law school, I continued my service at the Department of Justice as a federal prosecutor. And it's why I decided to run for Congress, to continue that service to my country at a time when I was so focused on the concerns I had, but also knowing that the way this country works is when we bring people together. And right now we are more divided than ever, and I think we need people in Congress with that mission. So much has happened um, since you won your first election um, to this country as a whole. Um, just as you said, we're as divided as as probably we've ever been. How did we get there, and how has it impacted you, as as a mom, and as a, a congressperson? I would say it's hard to say that there's any one thing 
that got us here because I think there are numerous things. I mean, disinvestment from, um, you know, places in the middle of the country, moving American manufacturing out of America, um, really uh, seeing people who saw their parents um, live a very middle class, secure lifestyle and feeling like they couldn't provide that for their family and that something was wrong. Um, The movement of so much of the wealth in this nation into the hands of a very few people. I think this country, we are at our best when we have a strong and thriving middle class and we have pathways into the middle class for for poor people. Um, And and we've sort of um, lost some of that economic mobility in part because we just haven't invested in this country. We haven't invested in infrastructure. We haven't invested in research and development. We haven't invested in modernizing our military. I mean, things that we have seen other countries like China doing quite well over the past several decades. And so if we're going to compete in the future, those are the things we have to do. So I think people were feeling across the country that sense that something wasn't working like they wanted it to in America. And unfortunately, I think too many of them came to um, a place where they were just done with their faith. In, in our government and our government's ability to address these, these concerns. And I am hoping that as we see the impact of things like investment in research and development, in reshoring American manufacturing, in investing in um, new technologies and and driving down inflation through our supply chains and with the CHIPS Act and manufacturing semiconductor chips here in this country, I am hoping that we can build back that faith in our ability in this country to do great things, because that is when we're at our strongest. And I think that is when we're at our most united. You uh, have talked a lot so far about um, the economy and and um, making it available to all of us. Um, and there's some polling out there uh, over the last couple of weeks that suggests that that's what a lot of uh, people in New Jersey particularly are thinking about. You know, it's the economy, stupid. Um, but Democrats, by and large, keep coming back to the issue of uh, reproductive rights, um, which one poll showed was down at like number seven uh, on the list of, of people's uh, big issues. Um, do Democrats ha- face the danger of talking about apples when people want to talk about oranges? Well, I think we can do both. We can talk about apples and oranges, and we should do both. Um, We owe it to our constituents because I'll tell you, I, you know, from the minute I started running for Congress, I have been focused on the economy of New Jersey. I, you know, I have a graduate degree from the London School of Economics and, um, and really care deeply about our current economy, but the potential of our economy and how we have, how we are able to get the most out of what we're doing here in New Jersey for our families and our kids. But I hear every day from people in my district, not just women, but people in my district who are really concerned about the loss of rights and freedoms for women across the country. And I have to tell you, I feel that deeply. I have daughters. What is their future going to look like? I mean, for 50 years, we had our rights embedded in the Constitution. And to suddenly have those stripped out and stripped away, it feels like the rug's been pulled out from under us. To have women being told that, you know, if you travel, you might have to change your contraception because you're not going to be able to get your prescription filled in certain parts of the country. Or um, to be told that if you're pregnant, there are certain parts of the country that if you're having a miscarriage, you're not going to be able to get care in a hospital as you're bleeding. Um, To know that there are places in this country where the response by government in certain states to a 10-year-old getting raped and impregnated is carry that, that pregnancy to term. So these are shocking things for many of us and things that feel like a huge rollback of rights and freedoms because it limits us in where we can choose to live and work and travel in so many different ways. And that is not that is not and that has never been the vision of this country. You hear uh, a lot of Republicans, including uh, your opponent, um, say, I um, support a woman's right to choose with restrictions. Isn't that just kind of the antithesis of supporting a woman's right to choose? I mean, what do you think when you hear that? <laughs> you, yeah, that it it does seem like um, 
you know, two opposite things. To say that um, I support the Supreme Court in overturning Roe, which he has said. Um, I support states in their ability to completely ban abortions with no exceptions, which he has said. But I support a woman's right to choose. Those two things are opposite each other. You simply can't hold both views. What is your sense of, in New Jersey, uh, the state of the Republican Party? There seems to be, and I guess this is a national thing too, but we see it a lot in New Jersey here, a battle for for the hearts and minds of Republicans. Um, have you seen that o- over the last several years? And w- who's the key to having created that environment? You know, I think what we have seen erode in this country is um, a thoughtful discussion about policy that appeals to the majority of Americans. Um, too many times people hear from the extreme wings of the parties. Yeah. And um, and I think that is why, you know, I speak to so many Republicans, because a lot of us care deeply about um, choice. And a lot of my Republicans care deeply about choice, yeah. I have to tell you. Guns, the environment, infrastructure, our economy, the economic future, um, Basically, the belief in our values as Americans, our national security, supporting Ukraine. These are these common. are issues that we hold in common. Which, this was what was so incredibly surprising in my first race and, and almost heartbreaking in a way was how easy it was to figure out what those issues were that everyone left, right and center in my district, what those issues were that they were talking about. And coalesce around a message that that the majority of people, the large majority of people in my district felt like would address their deep concerns. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about January 6th because the hearings are, are wrapping up um, this week. When you look back on that, do you see it as a momentary spasm or is it the, the symbol of, of the great chasm in our country that ha- has opened and, and may not be filled? I wish I certainly can't say it's a momentary spasm because it's so aberrant to the history of our country to have a president of the United States, despite the democratic election that was just held and the will of the American people, to decide to do everything he could, including strong arming Republican secretaries of state and um uh, sending spurious briefs into courts across the nation and searching, um, despite being told again and again and again for areas where there was actually voter fraud um, that had been found to affect the election. He did not find that. And yet again and again and again, continuing to try to disrupt that election to the point where he decided to send a mob against Congress in the hopes of denying the ability to certify the election, denying Congress the ability to do that in a, a violent insurrection. And so if this was just a spasm, then in the aftermath of that, every single member of Congress who has taken an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America would have voted to impeach him yeah. because that's so aberrant and that didn't happen. So it's not a momentary spasm. Um, but is it a, a long-term thing that will forever... Um, impact us? I certainly hope not, because I I think we are continuing uh, month after month, year after year now, to work towards a common understanding of why our democratic values are so important and to continue to work to gather that consensus again in this country are so they, we can move forward. Are they at risk? Is democracy as tenuous as some people suggest? I guess what... Um, What has concerned me is the sense that um, people are taking our democracy for granted as almost inevitable. And when I go, and I've traveled several times, when I go to a place like Ukraine, where people are willing to give their lives for democratic values because they know what the alternative looks like, I sometimes don't get that same sense of appreciation here. And and I think what people are missing, because 
many people in this country didn't grow up during the Cold War now. Um, many people haven't really had a chance to see so explicitly the alternative. What they're missing is that democracy is the one form of government that we've had on this earth that really places faith and trust in individuals. And when you do that, you help individuals flourish with rights to freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly, to choose the job you want to choose, to choose the way you want to live your life. And that has created the most innovative and diverse country in the United States of America as we move forward with a diversity of thought and plans and feelings and emotions and art. I mean, look at the art coming out of the Soviet Union. That tells you all you need to tell about really um, really stamping down the human spirit. And now we see in Putin someone who is willing to do just that, to, to kill thousands, hundreds of thousands of his own people in his own egocentric way. And there are some people in this country that seem to want to support him over Ukraine. And to me, that, that says a deep misunderstanding of why democracy is so valuable. I, I, I saved the most, one of the most complicated questions for the, for the end. So try and be as brief as I possibly can, as you possibly can. Uh, but inflation. So you're giving me the most complicated question, and I need to like. And the least I amount got of like time. a minute. You okay. Got, no, you got five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, but we talk about inflation. How did we get to 8%? You know what? Don't answer that question. Um, you hear people say, oh, I'm going to break the back of inflation as if it were that easy. Is there a, a legislative fix that can suddenly you know, tamp down inflation? You have 10 seconds. There's no legislative fix that can suddenly tamp down inflation. There yeah. are legislative things we have done to address the root causes of inflation. So with our supply chain, for example, with the CHIPS Act and, and um, building semiconductor chips here to drive down the cost of automobiles, for example. Um, but inflation is really a monetary issue that the Fed handles. And that's why you keep hearing so much about the Fed. Um, and, you know, I would say there are a, a, a lot of complicated reasons we got here, not the least of which is during an expansionary economic period. Um, the previous administration, um, when you should be fiscally prudent, was anything but, you know, adding to the deficit, creating more a more fragile economy so that when we went into um, – this pandemic, we we had very few tools to address this. Now, as we're coming out, I think uh, I think the Fed acted too late. I think they missed this. I kept hearing it was, you know, like I said, I um, I've worked with economists for years because I I you know have a degree in economic history and I'd study it and and um, there's a lot of group things sometimes and they kept saying it was transitory and I kept saying I, I don't see. I, the structural inefficiencies I'm seeing and things like the supply chain don't seem like they're gonna go away like that. Yeah. Um, and so I think they missed it. And now we're trying to get ahead of the curve, which is really, really difficult. And part of the problem is we've not had an inflationary period like this. The 80s was stagflation. It was long term. There were huge joblessness rates. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very different economy. We have some really good things going on in the economy. And I think what everybody is trying so desperately to do is to get past the curve of inflation while not driving us deeply into a recession. Yeah. All right. Representative Mike and Cheryl, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Wonderful to be here. Thanks so much. We've invited Republican Paul DeGroote to join us for a podcast interview. We hope to bring you that conversation in the very near future. NJ Decides 2022 Election Exchange is an NJ Spotlight News production. Jamie Kraft is our executive producer. The executive in charge of production is Joe Lee. Rob Rowan is our producer. Our director is Elvin Badger. And our audio engineer is Frank Brown. Chloe Matisi is our production manager. And David Krieger is our audio engineer. I'm David Cruz. Thanks for watching. 